much. Glad to be here. Uh, start off with a lot of questions. We're going to talk a lot about a lot of things. Uh, and of course, the one question everybody wants to know is, how can you get paid to be wrong so often? So we'll talk about that at the breaks. So if we can get started with the, there we go, with the slides. You can see a picture of the tornado as it's going near 15th Street and um, McFarland near Tuscaloosa, in Tuscaloosa near the university. Very tragic day. I've been with the National Weather Service for 30 years. I've uh, worked in seven states, including Texas. I've seen horrific events. This by far is the most horrific event I've ever been through as a meteorologist in my career. And for many of our staff, many of them much younger, it's been very traumatic on them. Now, we can talk about the trauma of the folks, and we, we're going to talk about some of these things. But from a meteorology perspective, I heard one of the younger forecasters say, you know, up until this day, it was kind of like a video game. We were looking at radar and issuing warnings. But to actually see what we call the debris ball in the hook of a, of a storm, in a hook echo on radar, knowing that lives were being lost, people were being injured, it was a very traumatic experience couple of statistics. On average, Alabama averages about 37 tornadoes in a typical year. The all-time record was 94 set in 2008 for the entire year. So far in month, this month of April, we have had 99 tornadoes in the month of April. We broke the all-time record number of tornadoes in the state of Alabama in one month. And right now, as for the year, we're up to 108. Now, what is very unusual for this event is that, on average, tornadoes are weak. And when we use the term weak, of course, everything is devastating. But weak tornadoes make up about 85% of the tornadoes that occur. Strong tornadoes make about 13 14%. And about 1 to almost 2% of the tornadoes in Alabama are violent. We had probably just as many violent tornadoes. Well, we had more violent tornadoes in this one day than we've had from 2000 through 2010. So it was just an incredible event. And uh, from our perspective, uh, one that we hope never happens again. So I have a little bit of misinformation here. When I put the stats together, we actually have 238 have perished in Alabama. 34,000 in five states from this event have applied for FEMA assistance. And this is, unfortunately, the amount of deaths has made Alabama, as far as tornado fatalities, the leader in the nation, as far as the number of people that have died since 1950 across the entire nation. So the National Weather Service has spent millions, billions in technology. And many people have come up, and said, come up to us and said, you did a great job. Look at all the lives you saved, but yet look at all the lives were lost. And we have warnings with 20, 25 minutes lead time, and yet all these people died. So why is that? And that's what's really eating at us. So I, I so much appreciate being here tonight to talk with you because I get to ask questions that we talk about in the office all the time. And it's not about meteorology. We, well, we do talk about meteorology a lot, but I get to ask questions tonight that I'm going to pose to you for all of you brilliant minds here for us to try to get our arms around. So why are the factors of why so many people were killed? Some of it had to do with being in the wrong place at the right time. Some folks were not paying attention, didn't know anything was going on, and they were fine. There were other people that took the right actions, got into their safe places. You've heard of all on the TV in the area, right? All the TV stations that talk about get to the lowest floor, put as many walls between you as possible, get to the basement, and yet many of those people died. Some of it has to do with complacency. Warnings are issued all the time. There's wall-to-wall -wall TV coverage. The sirens are going off all the time, and nothing happens. There was fatigue. Uh, you know, we had a lot of storms that came through early in the morning. I think some people thought maybe that was the event for the day. But a lot of people did pay attention to this. I think that we were advertising the, an outbreak. We didn't even anticipate this many storms being an outbreak. but. So many people knew that we were talking to major companies like Alabama Power, and they were trying to predisposition people to be in certain places. The governor for the state of Alabama signed an emergency declaration before the storms even developed. I think that's un unprecedented. I don't know if that's occurred before. 
But what about also some of our problems we have in Alabama? A lot of our tornadoes and violent tornadoes occur at night. They're not just daytime tornadoes. Um, we run into a problem of how do we keep track of all these things that are going on? Well, you know, a lot of people think, uh, you've seen all the ratings, right? It was uh, an EF4 tornado. Now, EF4, let me explain that real quickly. We use what's called the Fujita scale, and now we talk about what we have is the enhanced Fujita scale, the EF scale, zero through five. Zeros and ones are weak, twos and threes are strong, fours and fives are violent. So it's a damage scale. Radar does not detect wind speed. It detects circulation, and we can infer wind speeds from it, but we actually have to go on the ground and inspect the damage and then rate it. And so really, the Fujita scale is a damage scale, not a wind scale. We look at the damage, we have some training, we bring in some subject matter experts at times, and we did for this event. And what we have that you're looking at here are what called um, damage indicators for different residences, homes, uh, those kinds of things. So we start using these damage indicators to look at what's going on. And then we look at the degrees of damage for what we're looking at. So you can see some numbers there, and you have, you can see an EXP is the expected wind speed, you have a lower bound, and you have an upper bound. Well, why is there such a range? Well, it has to do with construction and construction variables. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see things like, look at the lower right, and you can see the, uh, what's called the sill plate, and look at the J-bolt here. And then you can look at the uh, boards, the two by fours running up, and you can see these are called clips, or a lot of people refer to them as hurricane clips. That adds a lot more sturdiness to a, a building, makes it more sturdy, much more wind resistant. Versus, look at the right hand, or the left hand side, excuse me, and look at some of these boards. They're just nails, plain nails holding the sill in place. And uh, you can see what happens is when you don't have very strong connectors, you can have things like the total houses right here that are just blown off their foundation, moved. Notice how there's very little in the middle picture, there's very little wind damage, but the entire house has been shifted about 50 feet off the foundation. That all has to do with construction methods. This is a picture that I took this past Saturday, uh, northeast of Montgomery, as uh, we were kind of helping delivering some water with folks, and a whole bunch of us were doing that. And uh, this is a typical house that had damage, got hit by an F3 tornado. But I want you to notice here, look at the, uh, it's probably hard to see, but look at the bottom here. You can't see any, there's no J-bolts. There's just one, there's a nail right here in the middle, and there's another nail. These nails, one nail holding the, the, the sill plate in place, basically 36 to 48 inches apart. So people said to us, well, the whole foundation was swept clean. It had to be an EF5. And the fact of the matter is, it takes much less wind to take these houses away and to cause this amount of damage. And, of course, that translates, I think, to death and injury. Unfortunately, this is what's all that's left of what used to be a mobile home. I couldn't find the manufactured home. Probably, um, I looked around and finally found it about 100 yards away. Unfortunately, three people died here at this place. Manufactured homes make up about 16% of all residences in the state of Alabama. Okay, about close to 320,000. Now that's by the year 2000 census, I got this information. So about 1.3 million residences across the state, 320 of them being manufactured home. We cannot rate a tornado higher than EF3 with manufactured homes because it only takes EF3 damage, EF3 winds, to totally demolish a manufactured home. So that's a real problem. We have a lot of folks that if they couldn't afford, if they couldn't live in a manufactured home, they couldn't afford to live anywhere. So that's a, that's a dilemma that we have. So some of the question is, what's next? What, these are some of the questions that we're starting to ask, is who's responsible for all this rebuilding that's going to take place? Soon, as we start seeing all the damage cleared, everything picked up, homes are going to be rebuilt. And I'm not blaming anybody in particular here. So anybody that's here in the housing industry or anything like that, I, I'm not trying to lay blame. I'm, maybe some of these homes are, are built to code. 
And you see some of these things, and you think, well, manufactured home, and, and look, we're in a room here, probably many of us have, compared to others in the state, are more affluent than others. So you might have a nice home that's all brick that really might only have a couple nails holding it down around it. And so our homes can really withstand gravity really well, but a lateral force or an upward force, they're going to go much sooner. So what are we going to do about this issue? Is there anything that we can do about this issue? How do we get, do we need to improve the building codes? Do, um, who, who's responsible for that? How are we going to go ahead and, and go about making these changes? It's been a big struggle in the hurricane areas to try to get housing, especially like in the state of Florida, to get all these codes in place. Um, you know, and I think, remember the 2000 tornado in Tuscaloosa, the F4 that hit? I think after that tornado, there were some grants made available by the federal government that a lot of people used to build safe rooms. Safe rooms in your house, uh, maybe community shelters, which is the picture in the lower middle, or uh, I have an illustration of an underground shelter. So you have a historic rare event of violent tornadoes that literally, we told people, a lot of people only would have survived by driving away or getting underground. How do we do that? Do we, do we make, do we leave it up to the individual homeowner? What do we do with trailer parks? Do we have the trailer park community go in and get a community shelter where everybody can get underground? What are you going to do now that you have this new information? You know, the chances of being struck by a tornado are pretty rare. But the outbreak that occurred affected thousands and thousands of people. And each year, high winds, non-tornadic winds, and tornadoes affect thousands more. Oh, boy, and this is a tough one. What about schools? Ever since the Enterprise tornado, that's the, the Enterprise Alabama is in southeastern Alabama in 2007. That was an F4 that hit the school. You remember that? There was a lot of media attention about that. In my career, I have never seen the amount of nervousness about what to do with schools. We are now seeing schools across Alabama that are canceling school when watches are issued. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? So you can say both sides. Well, what are you doing with these kids? You're letting these kids go home to mobile homes. Or if they're high school kids and you have two parent things, God knows what the teenagers are doing once they leave school, right? Where are they going? Where are they hanging out? What are they doing? But the other part is it takes about two to two and a half hours for these buses to make the complete school route. So they need time. So now what are we going to do? Are we going to keep our kids when the storms start developing at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and last until 8 o'clock? Are we going to keep the kids in, sheltered in place for five, six hours? What are we going to do with schools that really don't have great places to stay? And there's many of them. What are the requirements for schools to have safe rooms in place? Do we retrofit them? Do we just get by? So there's a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of questions, and I see both sides of the dilemma. Boy, I think it's really tough right now to be a school superintendent, really hard. And then you have parents who say, well, I'm not, I'm not bringing my kid, I'm bringing my kid home. And so what do you do when the storm's developing, and the parent now rushes to the school and says, I want my kid out of here, and you, and you think, well, it's better for you to stay here versus go home. What rights do you have to keep that kid there? I told you, these are questions we talk about at the weather business. It has nothing to do with weather, but we think about these things because these are the questions that we're being asked. And one of the things we do as meteorologists, we never tell folks what you should or shouldn't do. Our job is to tell you what the weather conditions, what the threats are, and help you to make your own decisions. I get questions all the time. Well, do you think I'm a good, you think I can drive from here to here and get there before this, you know, you think I'll do okay? And it's like, well, how good of a driver are you? I don't know. So, uh, you know, that's the things with the schools. Well, should we let school out? We don't get asked that by superintendents. But should we let schools out? And I'm saying, here's where the storms are going to hit. This is what's going to happen. What are we going to do? So, I think part of this is education. If those of you have, who have been around in the 1998 Oak Grove tornado, 
went through the west side of Birmingham, killed a number of people in Jefferson and in St. Clair County. We have an opportunity probably for the next three to five years to really make some progress. After that, if nothing happens, we're all going to go on with our lives. We're all going to be going to new, or the new phone technology we have or new computer or life is going to get us into vacation, and that's normal. We need to live life to its fullest. But we have a real opportunity right now, folks, to make some really hard decisions to protect people. And so how are we going to do that? Who is going to be responsible for that? And again, I think part of the education process is teaching folks. And I use this as a good example. You know, we hear about all the flooding that's going on in the Mississippi and surrounding areas right now, right? How many of you have heard about the 100-year flood? Okay. How many of you think that that means that you're going to have a flood of record once every 100 years? Be honest. Okay. A few people. It really doesn't mean that at all. What that means is you have a 1% chance in any year in a 100-year period of having a record flood. And we see over and over again that the 100-year flood occurs three years in a row or five years in a row. Or then it doesn't occur for 150 years. So uh, these things happen, and that's all part of the education process. So I leave you with this today. Who's responsible? What are we going to do to make progress in these areas? How are we going to protect folks and really take it to the next level? Because unfortunately, I've seen this time and time again in my career, and we have a saying in the weather business, it's not a question of if it's going to happen again, it's a question of when. This event will happen again. I pray to God it's not here in Alabama. But it's going to happen again. And I uh, challenge you here tonight to see what we can do together to uh, make some progress. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.